All right, I'm used to New York where people are loud, so don't be quiet. Um, I feel it would be wrong for us not to acknowledge what this day is in the lives of Palestinians. Um, today is Palestinian Prisoners Day, um, and there is the, the website right there, I put it up there. Um, there's been an initiative taken by the Palestinian Human Rights Organization, Adamer, to um, get people to sign on to a statement against the administrative detention policies of the Israeli state, just so people have a, a, a sort of broader kind of mise en scène of what goes on there. Um, although you're welcome to check out the details there or ask questions about it later. But since 1967, since the occupation of the West Bank and Gaza territories by the Israeli state, 750,000 Palestinians have been arrested, and uh, which is approximately 20% of the Palestinian population in Israel, Palestine, and 40% of all males um, in that period, and another 10,000 women, um, 50,000 under administrative detention. To just give you a, a quick, um, you know, uh, kind of Reader's Digest understanding of what that means, it means you are arrested, you are not necessarily charged with anything, you are not tried um, for anything, and you are basically put in prison for a six-month period of time. At the end of that six months, they can then tell you you have another six months and another six months, and this can literally go on for a period of years. This is an Israeli gulag. It's sort of Gitmo without the orange pajamas. Um, and right now, today, um, there are hundreds under administrative detention. Four of them are on hunger strike, the most uh, prominent of whom is now, I believe as of today, is the 262nd or 263rd day of his hunger strike. Uh, really kind of wrap your head around that, Samar Asawi. Um, so please sign in that statement uh, or at least go to the website and check that out. Um, and of course, here at Berkeley tonight, there is this resolution being debated and voted on um, by your ASUC. Uh, uh, and I think that um, whatever um, disagreements or criticisms I may have with some of the language uh, in, that, in that statement, that I think probably is a little bit too generous um, to the Israeli state. Nonetheless, I believe it would be a definite step forward for the University of California at Berkeley um, to take a stand against its continued investment in apartheid Israel. It is not the case that they would be politicizing the issue by signing on with the call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. It means that they would cease their political um, endorsement of the apartheid policies of the state of Israel by continuing to support corporations like Caterpillar, um, responsible, of course, it was their machinery um, that was used to murder Rachel Corey 10 years ago um, last month and um, destroy 20,000 Palestinian homes with these sort of specially rigged up uh, machinery, um, Hewlett Packard, a whole number of uh, uh, corporations are specifically named in the divestment um, resolution and to join with the University of California at Riverside and the University of, Cal well, I believe they've actually reversed that, University of California at Irvine and University of California at San Diego who have signed on to this divestment plan. And frankly, this has gone global. I mean, let's not just talk about it in the UC system. We're talking about the African National Congress, um, the leading ruling party in South Africa and the Congress of South African Trade Unions have signed on to the call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. And European uh, trade unions across the board are signing on. Even the United Methodist Church in this country has taken a position against investment inside of the occupied territories and companies doing business in the occupied territories. And as of just two weeks ago, a new campaign has been launched out of Vermont calling for not a boycott of Ben and Jerry's, but to pressure Ben and Jerry's, which as many people are probably aware, um, has many socially sort of progressive uh, mission statement and positions that it has taken historically. They are all also doing business in apartheid Israel and using um, Palestinian labor being paid at sub-minimum wage under conditions that cannot be considered anything other than sweatshop conditions and so are therefore collaborating with the apartheid state of Israel and there is a call for them to cease. They're not yet having turned into a boycott um, call on that uh, manufacturer and I can give people more information about that. So, so really what is being called upon is for um, the University of California at Berkeley um, um, to stand with this, this, this uh, uh, global call for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Um, and it, there is an urgent situation in, uh, among Palestinians. You're talking about a population, 60% of whom are living under the UN's definition of severe poverty, which is 
uh, having less than $2 a day in American dollars to live on. Um, prices in Palestine are not, uh, you know, pennies for something. It is um, very much like a, you know, a European uh, American style uh, prices. It basically leaves you uh, living at the behest of the World Bank and the United Nations and being a poverty case over a period of decades. Um, I, I do think it is um, important here to actually state what the um, what the call for boycott divestment and sanctions is before I get into more of this talk, because I think you know, the, 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 the term now is getting bandied about more, which is great. It's now finally broken in to the mainstream pa pa the papers of the, the pages of the mainstream press. The New York Times has now had several articles and debates airing this, the Los Angeles Times, the San Francisco Chronicle, Mercury News, on and on and on. Um, we have finally, congratulations, entered the rest of the world where we can actually have a conversation about what is going on in a territory that our own government is playing uh, an active uh, role in collaborating with the state of Israel and repressing the rights of the Palestinians. But this is what the call is. Very simple. There's three points to the BDS call. Number one, it calls upon Israel to end its occupation and colonization of all Arab lands and dismantle the wall, the apartheid wall, which currently runs some 400 miles um, throughout um, the West Bank and surrounds, of course, the Gaza Strip. Um, second, recognizing the fundamental rights of the Arab Palestinian citizens of Israel to full equality. I'm going to get to that in a moment. And third, respecting, protecting, and promoting the rights of Palestinian refugees to return to their homes and properties as stipulated in UN Resolution 194. It's a human rights campaign. It's a civil rights campaign, which is why luminaries like Desmond Tutu of South Africa, um, why Pulitzer Prize winning author Alice Walker, why civil rights icon Angela Davis, why Pink Floyd lead guitarist and singer and uh, vocalist uh, uh, Roger Waters have all joined uh, in, in calling for people to actively participate in this human rights uh, campaign, this civil rights struggle. That's what it is. That's what the call is really all about. That's what the controversy is about. Let's talk Turkey. How does Israel practice apartheid? It is a controversial word, to be sure, um, to use, but I believe it is quite accurate. And this is why. Um, I'll give a, a potted history of Israel and some examples of the way in which Israel is an apartheid state, and then talk a little bit um, from my vantage point as a, a socialist. I happen to be um, born Jewish. I'm, 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 I'm somewhat of a fallen Jew. I'm not a, I'm not a, um, I'm an atheist. Uh, uh, and, uh, but I, I, I think that it's important for us to talk about why um, we think the state of Israel pr pursues the policies that it does, and then um, say a few things about why this government supports Israel to the tune of billions of dollars a year in direct aid and billions more in loan guarantees and God knows what more in all sorts of military exercises and the sort of stuff that goes on on more subterranean uh, uh, levels. So how does Israel practice apartheid? Well, in 1948, we'll go back to the beginning, I swear I won't take you over every blade of grass of the last 65 years, uh, we'd be here all night. Um, Israel was basically founded as a Jewish state, and it calls itself that, and we'll get back to that moniker in a moment, and what that means in practice, on land that was ethnically cleansed from its indigenous population. It's simply a point of historical fact that even in Israel is, oh, is virtually undisputed that 700,000 to 750,000 Palestinians were um, driven off their land in 1948. And this central fact of ethnic cleansing, or what sometimes is referred to in Israel as transfer, which I guess is supposed to be a more palatable term, um, uh, is known. 1948 is known in, in, in Hebrew as Hagah HaAtzma'ut, the War of Independence, and among Palestinians, the Nakba, the catastrophe. Now, as of a couple of years ago, even teaching in an Israeli-funded, in a state-funded institution, um, to teach the Nakba and to commemorate the Nakba, which is to say the birth pangs of the state of Israel, is can, garner, can, can amount to enormous and even crushing fines by the state uh, up against people and even uh, uh, you know, criminal uh, 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 charges brought against um, anybody commemorating what is the ethnic cleansing, the, the acknowledged birth pangs of the state of Israel. Now, if you can try and imagine what it would be like in this country if to teach about slavery 
or to teach about the genocide of the Native American population would mean massive fines on any state institution, uh, you know, criminal charges and all the rest of that. I mean, that's what you begin to understand is the reality in the state of Israel. Now, to be clear, they don't teach about slavery and certainly don't teach about the genocide of the Native American population in this country, but it's not illegal. They simply do it out of racism and white supremacy and, you know, and political preference, but it's not illegal. Um, and if you're lucky, you have a decent teacher and you pick up a book and when you're in your tweens called 101 Changemakers and suddenly you find out that, you know, uh, Columbus didn't discover America and the pilgrims, you know, didn't, you know, help the Indians, uh, you know, grow corn um, uh, and all the rest and on and on and on. Um, but as a result of the Nakba, uh, most Palestini Palestinians essentially became refugees from their own land. Today, there are 11.2 million Palestinians in the world, this estimated, largely 69 to 70% of those 11.2 million people live outside of Palestine, Israel. That means live outside of what is often referred to as Israel proper, or if we prefer to refer here in this room, Israel improper, um, or and outside of the, um, the, the occupied territories. They either live in Jordan or they live in Syria. Um, half the population of Jordan is Palestinian or they live in the United States or Europe or wherever, but they do not live there. They are refugees and they may not by law return to Israel. <clears throat> no racial discrimination in, uh, against the indigenous popu population, against the indigenous Palestinian population is actually codified into Israeli law. Um, this is not really disputed. It's only in this country where things like this are not supposed to be said out loud. But the 1950 law of return entitles all Jews, all Jews and only Jews, um, to the rights of nationals, right? There is a distinction made in the state of Israel between citizenship and nationality. In this country, we all, if you were born here or if you have citizenship, you are not only a citizen, you are a national. You're American national. You're the same. Presumably, we know how it all plays out, right? Racism being woven into the very fabric of every aspect of American society, of course. That's taken as a given in this room. Um, but nonetheless, in Israel, you don't, do not all have the same rights. It is acknowledged by law you don't have the right, same rights as nationals. Um, no non-Jew can be a national. But actually, it goes even further. The 1950 law of return says that Jews from anywhere, it's extraterritorial, from anywhere in the world, no matter where you are born, can arrive at Ben Gurion Airport in Tel Aviv tomorrow and get citizenship and nationality and all the first class rights that come with it. Okay, think about what that means. I was born in Brooklyn. My parents were born in Brooklyn. My grandparents were born in Brooklyn, which means in the world of wandering Jews, I come from the most sedentary Jewish line. <laughs> we, at any moment, could go to Israel and become Israeli nationals and Israeli citizens as a result of our ethnicity, as a result of being Jews. That is something that is not accruable to the 70% of the population of Palestinians living outside of Israel and proper and the occupied territories, and the same rights do not accrue to the people, uh, to the Palestinian, uh, Palestinian citizens of Israel uh, or living inside of the occupied uh, territories. And this is, we're not talking about small handfuls of people. We are talking about 20% of Israel and proper are Palestinians. So it's important to understand that this charge or this description, I really don't think it's a charge, it's a description um, of Israeli laws as apartheid laws is not just something that socialists, that left-wingers, that people who aim to... Um, basically, uh, you know, in any way discredit the state of Israel charge it with. This is even what politicians and leading figures within Israel who are Jewish and who believe in the state of Israel. This is the term that when they are talking amongst themselves and often when they are talking to Haaretz, effectively their New York Times, this is how they describe the state of Israel. I'll give you a quote. In 2005, a fellow by the name of Roman Bronfman, a member of Israel's Yahad party, attacked what he called an apartheid regime in the occupied territories, West Bank and Gaza Strip, and went on to say, the policy of apartheid has also infiltrated sovereign Israel and discriminates daily against Israeli Arabs and other minorities. He goes on to say, in his words, the struggle against such a fascist viewpoint is the job of every humanist. Now, this is, this is an Israeli Jewish politician. This is spoken openly in the state of Israel. Words that are generally not allowed anywhere in polite company in the United States. We are not polite company here. Um, in 
it, you know, you go further. You, 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 you look at how many Jewish Israeli professors discuss in the academies, in the highest academy, in the Berkeley of, if you will, of Israel. Um, Oren Yifchatel has put it this way, Israel's very regime structure makes equality between Arab and Jew impossible in practice and in theory. Since the state system, these are his words, is predicated on a constitutional arrangement that contradicts the conditions of equal citizenship and therefore democracy. Critically, he writes, the essence of this contradiction stems from Israel's very raison d'etre. To be a Jewish state means that other people who are not Jews do not have the same rights as you. And again, Alice Walker, who is about 70 years old, 71, she grew up in the American South under Jim Crow in Georgia. Uh, Angela Davis, again, grew up in the American South under Jim Crow, both of them in 1950. She grew up in Alabama, as a matter of fact, her, friend, her, her family friends were the among the, the, the children who were, and the parents of the children who were bombed in the Birmingham bombing in 1963. Both of them, having visited Palestine, said nothing they saw there was anything like they had experienced under, under Jim Crow, that the conditions in which Palestinians live inside of Israel-Palestine is far worse than what they experienced in their youth in the 1940s and 1950s in this country under Jim Crow. So essentially, Israel is a Jim Crow state in which these laws are codified or institutionalized and accepted by and large by the population. Um, in terms of the allocation of land, and I won't go through every detail, but I want to give people a sense of the reality of life for Palestinians in some way and the illegality of these conditions, that this is not something you know, that the greatest democracy in the Middle East, as Israel continues to call us up, that this is not some sort of renegade notion that this is codified into the very institution, into the laws. That the Israeli status law dating back to 1952 basically um, outsources discrimination against Palestinians um, in terms of land allocation, like you know, building homes and schools and properties by basically having the Jewish National Fund which is one of these sort of like private public entities. Many people are familiar with their sort of little collection boxes in many Jewish neighborhoods or Jewish owned stores that, are, that adhere to Zionist ideology, collect money for the Jewish National Fund. That money um, goes towards securing land exclusively for Jews. By their own rules, they do not allocate any land for Palestinian building. 93% of the land of, uh, of Israel is controlled by the Jewish National Fund and these other sort of um, public-private entities that exclusively in their bylaws only allocate land to, um, to Jews. Um, you have something known as a, a wonderfully or Orwellian um, concept, the absentee property law, which actually classifies personal property of Palestinians who fled during 1948 from their, their land um, as absentee property, which became automatically, basically became the, the property of the state of Israel. And even those Palestinians who maybe fled one town and went to the town next to it, they are still considered present absentees. You're absent, but you're present. Which is it? Um, so they do not have rights to their own land. That, that, again, we're not talking about handfuls of people. That's a quarter of a million Palestinians right there who are, fall on into this classification of present absentees. Um, the, you know, I, I won't go into the endless you know, arcane laws around um, the national planning and building law, which creates this sort of arcane system of discriminatory zoning and you know, freezes land building and all the rest of that. But suffice it to say that over the last just few decades, tens of thousands of Palestinians attempting to just build homes, because you have to live somewhere, you have to live somewhere, have had their homes bulldozed by the Israeli state, claiming you know, that they don't have a right to be there. They don't have a right to be anywhere, is essentially what they are telling Palestinians, whose families have been there literally for generations and generations. Um, and of course, the, the biggest means of dispossessing Palestinians of their land is now at least 50 to 60 percent of the land occupied by Israel in the West Bank is now taken up by these settlements, which are recognized by international law as illegal settlements, and their own land, even to be able to travel between their own farms or their home or to go to school, or if you get sick and you need to go to the hospital, you have to go through these checkpoints 
in order to pass through this wall that goes, that sort of serpentines through the territory and cuts people off from their own land and carves out these sort of beautiful kind of like McMansion-esque, you know, um, condo um, villas and swimming pools and tennis courts and schools and country clubs for um, Jews only. And then you have the impoverished settlements of Palestinians. And in order to pass from one place to the other, you have to go um, through checkpoints in this wall, which even the Israeli government and, and the defenders, the sort of blinker defenders of the Israeli state insist is not an apartheid wall, that this is a barrier fence. Now, as I often say, a fence is what my grandmother used to put around the roses to keep the dog out. A 25-foot wall surrounded by concertina wire with guard towers and armed you know, men with, and women, and some of them are gay, they're very proud to say that, um, uh, who basically prevent Palestinians and, and, and deny them the basic humanity of having, of just going from place to place without having to pass through um, this absolute uh, uh, repressive system of checkpoints. That is day-to-day -day life. And, and to say going through a checkpoint, we're not saying they look at your pass and you go through. You could have to wait eight hours or 10 hours or two days to go through a checkpoint sometimes at certain places and then be denied. So even just going through the daily rhythms of life is an utter nightmare for the overwhelming majority of the Palestinian uh, population. I want to even just move on to, because many people say, oh, you know, the Israelis left the Gaza Strip to the Palestinians back in 2005, pulled out the settlements and are no longer there. Okay, there's some truth to this. But to say that they don't occupy it is to deny the reality of, you know, the wall, the checkpoints, the concertina wire, and, oh yes, the fact that all electricity, all water, the incoming and outgoing of all goods and human beings is completely 100% controlled by the state of Israel. So you have things like, you know, Palestinians paying four to 20 times the amount of, uh, for water that uh, a, a Jewish national will pay. And of course, they are restricted to somewhere around 10 to 60 liters a day. 100 liters, by the way, is the uh, per day ma uh, minimum standard set by the World Health Organization. By contrast, um, Jewish settlers uh, in the occupied territories in the West Bank get 275 to 450 liters a day. And in Gaza, they basically just let them stew. It is, it is and is often referred to, and accurately so, 1.6 million people living inside of the world's largest open-air prison. There's no other way to describe it. There's no other way to be accurate about it. And they do not control the incoming and outgoing of goods, of people, of water, or the electricity. None of that is controlled. None of the universities in Israel uh, have even teach in Arabic. You have 20% of the population speaks Arabic. Arabic is simply um, not spoken officially in these institutions. And on and on and on. The amount of money that is allocated in this country, it, in poor neighborhoods, obviously the allocation of funds in the public schools is a joke, is nasty, is, you know, it goes according to how much money, and usually there, there is a race line as well, how much money students get in one kind of school in, you know, inner city neighborhoods that are poor, as opposed to schools where you have uh, more upper class and largely uh, white students. The same thing applies only on an even grosser level. To give you some idea, the state financing of schools, um, Israel spends $1,100 a year per Jewish student and $191 for a Palestinian. I mean, and, and it's even worse inside the, the, the West Bank. It's even worse inside the West Bank on the days that the schools are open. Because in the West Bank, you're talking about $1,500 per child if you're Jewish, $60. It's about a year. Six, $60 if you're Palestinian. So this is, you know, and on and on and on. I won't go through all of the details here. What I do want to say, having, you know, laid out the basis for this claim, description of Israel's apartheid policies, that there is some distinction, because very often people say, oh, it's not like South Africa. It's not like South Africa. It's true. There is some truth to that claim. The, the kind of apartheid and the reasoning behind the apartheid in the state of Israel is somewhat different from what was practiced um, prior to 1994 uh, uh, and the you know, rise of Mandela and the, and the formal end of apartheid in the state of South Africa. Because really in South Africa, the whole point of the Afrikaner, the, the, the white European population, was to come in and colonize and hyper-exploit the black population, which was around 87, 88% of the entire population. That is not the point of Zionism. That is not the point of the occupation 
of Palestine from the vantage point of the Zionists, at the vantage point of the people who are for the state of Israel. They want to eliminate Palestinians from that land. They want them to leave. They want to create conditions that are so oppressive, that are so racist, that are so noxious, that are so unlivable and inhumane that they simply leave because they cannot survive there. And that is a very important distinction because when you are, as the South African working class, the black working class, was able to, in certainly as their momentum was able to rise in the 1980s, you know, they were able to actually shut down production. They produced things, they produced the wealth, they, they brought the diamond and the gold and all of the minerals out of the ground um, in South Africa that is used the, and sold and bartered on the world market. That is not the case. Palestinians are simply eliminated from the market entirely. And does anybody in this room who is unemployed at all understand that if there is anything worse than being exploited under capitalism, it is not being exploited under capitalism. And it creates a certain urgency and drive for the global movement for boycott, divestment, and sanctions. Because it is that global solidarity movement that helps give a certain strength that Palestinians on their own are incapable of really wielding. They do not have the same levers of power that the black workers in South Africa had because they cannot shut down production. Their brothers and sisters in Egypt, in Jordan, in, 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 in Lebanon, and around the world are crucial in our solidarity efforts. All of us are crucial in the solidarity efforts to the survival and to the liberation, ultimately, of the Palestinians. I want to go on to talk a little bit about, um, about why. I mean, why, what drives this, this absolutely fanatical level of racism um, of the Israeli state? And I, I, I believe that the, the, the late professor, uh, literary scholar and historian Edward Said was really put it best of, of, of all the people I have ever read on this question. Um, even back many decades ago when he wrote The Question of Palestine in 1979 because he, he latched on to the historical origins of Zionism and its political potency. And he said that for although it coincided with an era of the most virulent Western anti-Semitism. He's talking about the late 19th century, the origins of the idea of a separate Jewish state, of a, of a Zionist state. He said Zionism also coincided with the period of unparalleled European territorial acquisition in Africa and Asia. And it was part of this general movement of acquisition and occupation that Zionism was launched. And it is important to remember, he goes on to say, that in joining the general Western enthusiasm for overseas territorial acquisition, Zionism never spoke of itself unambiguously as a Jewish liberation movement, but rather as a Jewish movement for colonial settlement in the Middle East. In the Orient was his word, but that's what he meant. So, I mean, frankly, even the fact that we call it the Middle East, I mean, the Middle East in comparison to what? Only in comparison to London itself. Even the name of the region is itself a legacy of colonialism of the 19th century. He goes on to say, and I think he puts it so well here, imperialism was the theory, colonialism the practice of changing, and he's being facetious here, the uselessly unoccupied territories of the world into useful new versions of the European metropolitan society. Everything in those territories that suggested waste, disorder, uncounted resources, which did be converted into produ productivity, order, taxable, potentially developed wealth. And he goes on and on in that vein. And you read about, and I want to get to the point about why I think, at least, why I would suggest this policy drives and has such a, a viciousness to it. He goes on to talk about the dehumanization of the Arab in Israeli society, which to this day, is, is absolutely pervasive. I mean, the, the, the statements, the comments, the, the percentages of people who, don't, who believe that all Arabs should leave, that Arabs should not have the right to vote. And they can only vote, by the way, for political parties that are approved by the, by the Zionist state, that agree that Israel should exist as a Jewish state. So in order to even run for office and have a political party, you have to concede your own occupation and your own dispossession. That's the starting point to run as a political party and to vote. So what is there really to vote for? You're voting for the dog catcher. What, or what are you doing? What, what, what real rights, what real expression of genuine, genuine human um, aspiration for freedom, for equality, can happen when the starting point for your voting rights is to concede your rights? <laughs> it, it's, it's a non-right. It's a non-right right. There you go. Um, and he goes on to talk about how in 1973, during um, 
it, it was that during the war, uh, the rabbi, Abraham Avidan in Israel, um, basically sent off a message to the troops in Israel um, saying that when our forces encounter civilians during the war or in the course of a pursuit of a raid, the, the encountered civilians may, and by halachic standards, by Jewish law, even must be killed whenever it cannot be ascertained that they are incapable of hitting us back. Under, under no circumstances should an Arab be trusted, even if he is, gives the impression of being civilized. This is a rabbi. There's a rabbi speaking to the troops that it's OK to kill. It's, you know, you, it's kosher by Israeli law, essentially is what he said. I mean, exactly what he said. It's under halachic law. You must do this. And if you think for one moment that this is something out of an age old era, after all, 1973, that's some years ago, 40 years ago, then look at what happened just in 2009, when rockets were raining down on that open air prison known as Gaza, and uh, you know, where people couldn't move, couldn't leave, couldn't decide what was going to happen with them. Israel rained down rockets, murdered 1,400, it wasn't a war, it's a massacre. Where you shoot, shoot, I mean, they're just shooting people who had nowhere to go, right? They murdered 1,400 people. I think 13 Israelis were killed, nine of whom were soldiers. So we're talking about four civilians in Israel were killed. Um, the rabbi, the chief rabbi in that, in that uh, conflict, said there was absolutely no moral prohibition against the indiscriminate killing of civilians during a potential massive military offensive on Gaza aimed at stopping the rocket launchings. That was supposed to be the pretext. His rabbi son went on to say, if they don't stop after we kill 100, we must kill 1,000. Then we must kill 10,000. And if they still don't stop, we must kill 100,000, even 1 million, whatever it takes to make them stop. Now this man, this rabbi, Shmuel Eliyahu, who called for the killing of potentially a million Palestinians, a few days after he made this statement, he was made the head of the Israeli Red Cross, the Magen David. I think Martin Luther King had something to say about this. He explained it so well in the way he explained so many things. He said that a nation that will keep people in slavery for 244 years, of course he was referring to this nation, will thingify them, make them things. Therefore, they will exploit them and poor people generally, economically. And a nation that will exploit economically will have foreign investments and everything else and will have to use its military to protect them. All of these problems are tied together. The Palestinians have been thingified because the Israeli state didn't undergo a sort of process of colonization that ended at some point in 1967. The ongoing occupation of the West Bank and the Gaza Strip, and for that matter, the whole of Palestine, Israel, in which Palestinians are denied equal rights, is an ongoing process of colonization. It is, you know, it is an armed force with a state attached to it, basically, an ethnocracy with an armed force. And, and he has thingified and must continue to thingify the people of Palestine. I want to wrap up on this because I think what we have to understand is that we live in a society in which our government and our, you know, this week, you know, we paid our taxes. Um, our tax dollars go towards supporting this sort of thing. Your, evidently, now that there is a divestment discussion here on this campus, your student dollars are going towards the advancement of these apartheid policies. We owe a debt of solidarity to our Palestinian brothers and sisters. And the most effective way I believe that we can do that is through engaging and organizing the most public, the most vocal, the most confident boycott divestment sanctions movement in this country that we possibly can. You have no idea the sea change of what has just happened over the, even just the last 20 years. 15 years ago, 10 years ago, frankly, even five years ago, it would have been inconceivable that in the pages of the newspaper of record in this country, they would have run series of articles by Palestinians as well as by Jewish anti-Zionists like Sarah Shulman, you know, arguing uh, about how Israel uses um, their marginal rights for some gays in their society to basically pinkwash, um, you know, their crimes against the Palestinians. And yet that is now entering the papers. Just a few weeks ago, there was actually this lengthy, rather interesting and frankly quite good philosophical musing by a professor at, I believe, the University of Massachusetts about whether or not Israel has a right to exist, coming down on the side, no. What state that, that owes its very existence to the denial of human rights to another people has a right to do that? We don't have the right to oppress other people. That is not a right. 
Um, you know, and I think, and then, and then followed it up just one week later with a front cover magazine section about is this the third intifada, referring to the civil rights movement taking place inside of the occupied territories in Berlin, a peaceful, nonviolent civil rights movement. You know, this is what is taking place, this is what is on the rise, and this is an important, potent movement that we have to be much more, I would say, much more aggressively outward about. Because we understand that it's not going to be really, in the immediate period, it's not going to be through, you know, we're going to strangle Israel through, you know, uh, stopping $50,000 or even a million, or even at this point, $4 billion in contracts have been lost by Veolia, which is this sort of runs a lot of the transportation and municipal uh, services in the occupied territories and around the world. They've lost $4 billion in contracts through this activist campaign globally. Israel can find people who write checks to amount that amount of money and replace that in a year. That's not really the true power at this time of BDS. It is about taking the actions that Israel already is doing in delegitimizing itself and making them public in order to make of Israel what we made of South Africa, a pariah state to the world. You don't play sports in South Africa. You don't play music in South Africa. We don't entertain apartheid. And we simply don't allow our student dollars to finance the racism of an apartheid system. That's it.